There we are. Just trying to find the unmute button. Hello, everybody. Good morning and welcome to our Building the House of Stonewall event today in celebration of LGBT History Month. I'm Rebecca Clark and I'm the head of membership at the Chartered Institute of Housing who have organised the event today and done all of the whizzy stuff in the background to bring this to you. If anyone I can see in the chat, some people have found the chat and a couple of people are having issues. We are trying to get round to everybody in the background um, to sort any of those out. So if you are having any difficulties seeing, hearing us um, or you're unable to access anything, then please do let us know either by email or in the chat if you're able to. And we'll try our best to help you so you can join us today. So, as I mentioned, this event is in celebration of LGBT History Month, and it's the first of its kind that the CIH has actually led on. Um, we've made a very strong commitment in the last 12 to 18 months to really support and champion equality, diversity and inclusion across the sector. And moving forwards, that will be a real mainstay of our professional standards framework that we're developing. Um, which is designed to provide some standards and guidelines for the sector and for housing professionals on what good looks like. Um, and certainly lots of the principles in there will revolve around equality, diversity and inclusion. So moving forward um, with all of you here supporting today, I imagine you've got a strong commitment and passion yourselves. If you do have any feedback whatsoever, then please do let us know. And we do also have a member steering group established now for equality, diversity and inclusion and we meet on the second Friday of every month. So if anybody does want to join and commit more and you know, even come and listen to the things that we're talking about, then please do again, let us know and we can send you some more information. So today wouldn't have been possible. I'm not gonna talk for, for too long, but I do want to say a, spe a special thank you now, as well as at the end, before I forget, um, to Kat Haldane and the rest of, of the staff at Stonewall Housing, who are our main partners for today's event, um, hence the title Building the House of Stonewall. So we will hear lots of information today, really, that raises awareness, increases understanding, builds networks, but also champions the right things when it comes to issues experienced by the LGBTQ plus community when it comes to housing. And hearing the lived experiences of some of the speakers today, I think will really kind of hit home um, for people and be quite moving. Um, I'd also like to thank our other partners for today's event. Um, so House Proud will be joining us by John Stevens in a short while to do a, a short presentation. Um, but then also the National Housing Federation and Beth, um, who has supported us throughout in, in delivering today's event and promoting it. And thank you to all of you for joining us. So. Without further ado, I'm going to not steal any more thunder and hopefully we'll be able to bring Stephen uh, McIntyre to the stage, who's the Chief Executive of Stonewall Housing, to start us off on our first presentation. And I'll be on the questions box and everything, so please do keep chatting away in the background. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Rebecca, and good morning, everybody. I am, as Rebecca said, Stephen McIntyre, and I am the Chief Exec of Stonewall Housing. And my pronouns are he, him and his. I'm just delighted to be able to come to this event today. And thank you very much to everybody for coming. It's lovely to be able to welcome you and to celebrate LGBTQ plus History Month. And I want to say a special thank you as well to the Chartered Institute of Housing for really helping us to organise today's event and for hosting for us as well as the National Housing Federation, who are real champions of the work of both Stonewall Housing and LGBTQ plus housing issues in general. I also want to thank our colleagues from House Pride, who we're really delighted to have with us today, as well as all of our guest speakers who you'll get to um, meet as we go through. So let me tell you a little bit about what I'm going to talk about today. So first of all, I'm going to give an introduction to Stonewall Housing, really just to give you an overview of the work that we currently do. And I want to um, really take a bit of a step back and think about our foundations and how we were founded and to talk a little bit about our history, especially to celebrate LGBTQ plus history month. Um, I also want to have a conversation with you about the level of need so when we talk about LGBTQ plus housing issues in the UK, what is it exactly that we're talking about? I'm going to just share my perspective of that with you. 
And then I want to um, answer the question that we get asked most often whenever we're out and about talking to people about Stonewall housing, which is the question of why is it that we need specific services for LGBTQ plus people? What, what is the reason for that? And then I'm going to end my presentation by thinking about um, our future planning in Stonewall housing. And really what I want to um, demonstrate to everybody today is our commitment to partnership working. And I want to invite all of you to think about how we might be able to work together to really improve things for LGBTQ plus people um, who need the support of the housing sector. And I'm going to kind of do a bit of a call to action, you know, to really help you think about what you might be able to do and, and what support you might need with it as well. So let me um, talk to you about what we do already. So Stonewall Housing works exclusively with LGBTQ plus people. We don't work with anyone else. These are only the people that we provide support to. And every year we work with around 1,200 people, something like that. We've actually seen an increase in the last year over lockdown. Um, but it's usually about 1,200 people that we work with every year. The vast majority of our service users are in London. So um, we do a lot of our work with people who need support in London. But we have seen an increase over the last couple of years, really, of people who are contacting us from outside of London. And that's why we're really delighted to see so many people here from all over the UK um, to really help um, have this conversation together as well. The other thing which I think is quite interesting is that we have seen um, an increase in the number of people who are care leavers contacting us. So that younger end of the spectrum, um, people who are LGBTQ plus and who are also leaving care and you know, want some additional support. And we've also seen an, an increase at the other end of the scale. So people who are over 55, who are LGBTQ plus and need some support around their housing situation. So it's quite an interesting mix of people that we work with. And one of the things that we feel very proud of is that we work with everybody who's LGBTQ plus and either homeless or at risk of homelessness, um, regardless of their age. So we feel very proud about that. The four things that we do are advice and advocacy. So similar to other organizations, we run an advice line um, uh, where we might give some signposting to people. We might give them some basic advice, really just kind of help them navigate the housing system and, and teach them some of the things that they need in order to move that forward. Where the needs are a bit more complex or perhaps the, the person needs some additional support, then we would escalate that to our casework service. And this is where we provide advocacy. And the, the way I discuss this and the way I think about it is rather than just kind of showing someone what they should do, oh, look, you need to do A, B and C, what we do is we hold their hand and we do it with them. So we really go through that process with them and we continue to work with people until their issues are resolved, usually somewhere between four and eight weeks, but um, we're, not, we're not defined by that. The second part of our service is our supported accommodation. So we have a number of houses throughout London where we work with people who are not quite ready to have their own tenancy for whatever reason. It may be because they're young and leaving care. Some of our service users are like that. It may be that they have particular issues around drugs and alcohol or mental health. You know, there's a, a number of different reasons, but the, it, it looks like the person isn't quite ready for their independent tenancy. And our job is to help them through that journey. And so we will um, work with some people from between six months and 18 months, something like that, to really help identify what support they need and then work with them quite intensively to move them forward with that as well. Um, we also provide a floating support service. And so this is kind of similar to supported accommodation, but people don't have to come and live in our houses in order to get this support. It may be that they live in a, one of our partner agencies. So it could be a housing association that has um, a specific need around LGBTQ plus issues. And we'll provide the floating support to go and meet with that person, engage with them, figure out what kind of support they need, and then put together a plan specific for them. We do this with local authorities, um, where it's particularly around um, young people who aren't quite at the, the stage where they need support at accommodation, but 
the local authority are concerned they might not be able to live completely independently. And we also do it with our partner agencies, both in the housing associations and the charity sector as well. And then the fourth part of our work is around training and consultancy. And this is about helping other organisations to make sure that they're doing everything they can to include um, LGBTQ plus people in the work that they do. So to really be inclusive. And our Director of Education and Engagement is here today, Tina, who's going to talk a little bit more about the work that we can do around training, as well as our inclusion standard. So that's kind of the work that Stonewall Housing does at the minute. And the way we see that is really as a, a foundation for helping to build the House of Stonewall. And this is kind of where today's um, event comes in and where we got the title for today's event. So if you think that everything we're currently doing as, as a bit of a foundation for us to work from and to engage with our partner agencies and think, right, okay, what do we do next? Now, the House of Stonewall is something that we are very proud of. Um, the House of Stonewall, you can think of it like a collaboration, a bit of a collective. And it's everybody who believes in what we are trying to achieve, all working together to make sure that LGBTQ plus people have got somewhere safe to live. So some of our members of the House of Stonewall are our ambassadors, and they're people who have been through the process they um, may have lived in one of our houses or had support from one of our um, key workers or contacted the advice line. And now they're using their story to kind of really help to elevate the message and let people know just how important it is to have um, LGBTQ plus specific support. And we're very lucky today because we've got one of our ambassadors, Corey, here, who's going to share with us his experiences of um, of coming through Stonewall Housing and, and what kind of impact it had on for him as well. And um, we also have, uh, the House of Stonewall is also made up of people who champion our mission. So these are people that might not have lived experience themselves, but they really believe in what we are trying to do. So they, they do things like help spread the word about the work that we're doing. They get involved in our fundraising. One of our champions who we're very proud of is Rebecca who um, is chairing today, she's a House of Stonewall champion. And one of the things that she's done has helped us to create this event. So it's that kind of contributing to what we're doing in any way you can, and really being a champion for the work of LGBTQ plus people who need support around their housing. And then we also, the other parts of the House of Stonewall are people who commission us to deliver work. They join us in our mission people who buy our training and who engage with our inclusion standard. You know, all of the different ways that people can really demonstrate um, to themselves, demonstrate to their employees and demonstrate to their service users, their residents, their customers, that they're really committed to inclusion and committed to LGBTQ plus inclusion. Kat, who is our founder of the House of Stonewall, is here today as well and she's going to talk a little bit more about that so that you can get a really good picture of what that looks like. What I want to do now is kind of have a look at our history and look at this picture, isn't it gorgeous? This is one of our earliest pieces of memorabilia that we have for Stonewall Housing and Kat found it in our archives for us and you can see the date just at the top, it's 1984 and it's just one year after we were founded um, that we find this. So back in 1983, a group of LGBTQ plus people, a group of lesbians actually came together and some of them had experienced homelessness themselves. Some of them had been, um, find themselves homeless after they came out. And what the other thing that they saw was that there was lots of people on the streets who were LGBTQ+. And if you think back to that kind of 1983, if anybody's been watching um, the It's a Sin programme, you know, you can imagine what it was like in London then. There was this sense of, if you came to London, you would find your people, you know? People who grew up in villages and towns around the UK, where they didn't really know any gay people or any lesbian people. And they were like, actually, you know, like I need to go to the city and find myself and, you know, kind of party and, you know, all of that kind of stuff really kind of um, engage with their community. 
And a lot of that was happening. And what some young people were finding was that actually they became very vulnerable when they got to London and they were ending up on the streets. And so this group of women kind of saw this happening and thought, look, this we need to do something about this. They had approached some mainstream um, housing providers. They find it very challenging to get support for themselves. Um, and they also had experienced quite a lot of discrimination. Again, you have to think about, you know, back in 1983, what it was like. You know, it wasn't too many years later that we got Section 28, where the government literally were trying to eliminate LGBTQ plus people from the education system. That was just a few years later. So, you know, you can imagine what it must have been like. We were also in um, the throes of the AIDS crisis, you know, and these kids that were coming to London all of a sudden were being struck down by this gay disease, which we now know, of course, isn't the fact, but that's what they were seeing and they were terrified. And so it was a real kind of scary time to be LGBTQ plus um, in the UK and in London in particular. And so these group of women um, got together and they created the first co-op. They literally got a house together with eight beds in it and they allowed people to come and have somewhere safe to live. And it was about people being able to really be themselves and be genuine and be authentic in who they were um, and have somewhere safe to live. And that's a value that really runs through everything that Stonewall Housing does now. We feel very proud of that history that we have, and we want to make sure that everything we do in the future um, works alongside that as well. Stonewall Housing was the first organisation to get some funding from the, GL, the GLC, as it was then, the General London Council, um, to really explore this issue of LGBTQ plus homelessness. And we were also the first organisation to get funding from Comic Relief to um, explore LGBTQ plus issues as well. And so it was that kind of um, trailblazing idea that again, we want to hold on to and take forward now into our next phase of development. Um, so now what I want to do is to think about, okay, well, how many people are there in the UK that might need our help? And why are there, you know, people who are LGBTQ plus and homeless? Why is this a thing, you know? And so if we think about the most common reasons for people to become homeless and for people that we work with to become homeless, we see parental rejection, domestic abuse and violence. We also see mental health up there. And, you know, I imagine that a few of you are thinking now, well, actually, that's the same as the people that we're working with that might not be LGBTQ plus. And you're absolutely right. You know, those those reasons for homelessness kind of are through the whole community. The difference with the people that we work with is about just under 80 percent of people tell us that they were rejected from their family home because of their identity. So this is just because of who they were. So because they were gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans, queer, that is the reason why they became homeless. 80 percent of those people. And just a few months ago, um, in around September time, I want to tell you about a young person that we were working with. He was 18 years old and he um, on a Friday night, he he was, you know, kind of building up the courage and he was getting excited. And he told his mum that he was gay. He he introduced his mum to his authentic self, you know, and what his mum did was ask him to leave the house. And actually, I'm not going to say that what his mum did was kick him out of, house, of the house, of home. You know, this 18 year old who describes his childhood as really positive or really um, kind of pleasant childhood, all of a sudden was kicked out of home immediately um, with only the belongings that um, that he had. And this and this young person was not street smart. You know, this was the first time that they'd experienced any kind of vulnerability and they didn't know what to do. And so he was kind of like didn't know where to go. He had nowhere, no one to stay with. But he did know that some homeless people sleep in the park. And so that's what he did. He went to Hyde Park. He went there on Friday. He slept there on Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And he was absolutely terrified. And on Monday, thank goodness, a dog walker found him and they and approached him. You know, she could see that actually this young person was particularly vulnerable and needed some support. So she approached him 
um, had a conversation with them, got them some food, and eventually they contacted us. And thank God we were able to find somewhere for that young person to go. And actually he's doing really well now and thriving. But the reason why I tell that story is because this happened just a few weeks ago. It wasn't a long time ago. It was in 2020. Um, and it mirrors the experience that our founders had back in 1983. And this is happening right now. The other thing that we have to think about is the experience of bullying that LGBTQ plus people have. And when we talk to our service users, they tell us that it, they experience bullying at school, at home, in the workplace, in the community, in their youth groups, everywhere that they go, they're experiencing some kind of bullying. And so that really compounds this level of vulnerability. And you can start to kind of think to yourself, you know, if you were LGBTQ plus and homeless, where would you where would you get your support from? Now let's have a look at numbers. So statistics in homelessness is difficult and statistics in LGBTQ plus homelessness is nearly impossible. But there was an uh, international study that was done in 2019. And what they found was that somewhere between 20 and 40 percent, it differs for different countries, somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of homeless people are LGBTQ+. Now, if you think about the UK, and for some of you, you may have noticed that in the census this year, for the first time, we're going to have a question about LGBTQ plus identity. So we might get closer to the truth of what the makeup of the UK looks like, which I'm really excited about finding out. But the best estimate we have at the minute is about 6%. So if 6% of the population are LGBTQ+, plus, why is it that 20 to 40 percent of homeless people are LGBTQ plus? Our colleagues at AKT did a study a few years ago with young people in particular, and they find that it was 24 percent of, um, of the cohort that was LGBTQ plus. Shelter did some research looking at the number of homeless people in the UK. And here we're talking about the official statistics around homelessness, not um, the people that we would consider at risk of homelessness, those who actually meet the criteria. And Shelter I, um, estimated that we've got about 320,000 people in the UK at any one time. And so if we believe that stat, of 20 to 40%, we're looking at something like 64,000 or a, to 128,000 people who are LGBTQ plus and homeless. Now, I told you before that we work with 1,200. So it's only a, it's a fraction of the people that actually need our support. And so that means that there's probably thousands of people who are getting their support through mainstream organizations. I'm going to ask you some questions now in the Q&A that I want us to kind of reflect on together and have a think about. So here's the question. How many of your customers are LGBTQ plus? And um, one of the people from CIH is going to put these in the Q&A for us now so that you can um, see the different options. What I'd like you to do is to upvote the question that um, that you think is the right answer. So we've got kind of 10%, 20%, 30% or don't know. Um, and I just want you to do a little upvote just so we can get a bit of an idea of, you know, what, what LGBTQ plus people are getting support in mainstream organisations. Now, some of, some of you and some organisations won't be able to answer this question. And they won't be able to answer this question simply because they don't ask. So whenever their customers, and when I say customers here, I mean residents, the people that come to you for support, the people that live in your um, accommodation, your neighbours, you know, the, the people um, who need housing support. And um, often we find that people don't ask their customers whether they're LGBTQ+. And when we go out and do our training around the country, one of the things that staff tell us is that they feel awkward to do it. They're really worried about saying the wrong thing. They're really anxious that they're going to upset someone by asking that question. They think it's very intrusive. They're not quite sure of the language and what the right way of saying it is. And so I would, I would argue that actually that's one of the reasons that it just hasn't fallen into practice because people aren't feeling confident to ask the question. 
Others of you won't be able to answer this question because even now in 2021, LGBTQ plus people are disguising their true identity when they come and ask for support. Even now, they're not able to be their authentic selves when they go to places that are, dis that are designed to really help and support them. I'll have a wee look at the answers to the, the questions later on, but if you just kind of upvote and I'll, I'll come back to it at the end of the, of the presentation. So why is it that people in the UK um, would find it difficult to be their true authentic selves? And why do we need specific services for LGBTQ plus people? This is what people ask me all the time. They kind of think, well, look, you know, why don't they just go to their doctor and get the support from the doctor? You know, like surely the NHS is really inclusive. Surely the local authorities are really inclusive. You know, why is it that we need these specific um, services? And so here's some stats. Now, these come from a number of different uh, areas, some from the Stonewall research that was done uh, a, a two or three years ago, some from the big national LGBT survey that we did as well. And I'm happy to share the links with people. But what we learned was that one in five LGBTQ plus people have experienced a hate crime. And I want you to just think about that. Think about five of your gay friends or five of your LGBTQ plus friends one of them will have experienced some kind of hate crime. Now we know that people, um, hate crimes are increasing. If you look at the statistics every year, um, and some of that will be about you know better reporting. And we know that the police are doing a fantastic job. We hear really good stories about the police engaging with people who've experienced LGBTQ plus hate crime. But some of that is a real indication that this is still happening. I mean, you know the stories, don't you? You've heard about those two young women who were forced to kiss on a bus and then attacked. You've heard about the young couple who were walking along the river holding hands and were beaten almost to death. You know, like really challenging situations for people um, experiencing these hate crimes. 70% um, of people who are LGBTQ plus avoid being open about their identity. So 70% of people are not able to be their true selves. And what we're talking about here is people like me, you know, people like me who are not able to hold their partner's hand whenever we go out for a walk. I've been with my partner for 12 years and we're the type of couple that want to hold hands and want to be affectionate with each other. You know, one of those <laughs> couples, um, but we can't do it because we know it's not safe. We live in London. And we know it's not safe for us to hold hands whenever we go out. I think that's disgraceful, you know. And if you think about, you know, I'm the chief exec of an LGBTQ plus organisation. You know, I'm not particularly vulnerable. Think about some of our vulnerable service users and some of the vulnerable people that we work with and what it must be like for them as well. One in eight people have been attacked at work. And when I say attacked at work, I mean physically attacked at work because they were LGBTQ+. One in eight of us have had that experience. I mean, part of this makes me want to laugh because I can't even imagine being attacked at work at all, never mind being attacked at work because of who you were. And then the, the most shocking statistic, in my opinion, is this one um, at the end, which is 10% of people, 10% of the general population in the UK believe that LGBTQ plus people are dangerous to others, that they're predatory, that they want to cause harm to young people, that they want to cause harm to um, their colleagues. And, you know, that to me is something that is really shocking here, here in 2021, that people still have that kind of opinion. Now, as you start to think about that experience, you might also start to understand why it is that LGBTQ plus people continue to find it difficult to be open about who they are, even now, even though we're allowed to get married now, you know, like, isn't that good news? Even though all the, the laws have changed and discrimination against someone because they're LGBT is um, illegal, we're not able to do that anymore. But even, even all of those really positive moves forward, there's still a lot of real trauma associated with being LGBTQ plus in the UK. In preparation for today, I wanted to have a uh, wee look at what our service users are saying. So these are the people that we've worked with and we ask them questions about engaging with um, an LGBTQ plus organization. So you can see here 97% 
of people say that it's important to them that they have workers who understand what it's like to be LGBTQ+. 91% say that having a worker who is LGBTQ+, makes it easier for them to access support. And 84% of people say that they wouldn't be able to get the same type of support from a non-LGBTQ plus organisation. Now, of course, we know that that last stat isn't true. You know, LGBTQ plus people are getting support from mainstream organisations. Some of you will be providing that support and they're getting really fantastic support. But this interesting thing here for me is that this is what people think. You know, this is what people, when they are looking for somewhere to get support, they think they're not going to get the same level of support from a non-LGBTQ plus organisation. We um, work with a young person who was originally placed in a mainstream hostel. Um, he, he had his own room, a uh, shared bathroom in a mainstream hostel, and he was experiencing homophobia from other people that lived there and actually from some of the staff as well, which is rare, but it does happen. And um, one of the things that happened to him was that somebody scratched a homophobic word into his door, the door of his bedroom. It's a word that I wouldn't even repeat just to tell the story. Um, and he was terrified. And he tells us that he used to listen outside his door to make sure that there was no one there and that the coast was clear before he would go to the bathroom or before he would leave to go to the supermarket. Um, and that experience has really challenged him and really scarred him in terms of his experience of trauma and again it's just an, a, an illustration of um of what it's like to be lgbtq plus and to be in that vulnerable situation okay so so that's kind of our journey up until now a little bit about why we need to have specific um lgbtq plus organizations um, and a little bit of the prevalence of the work and the people that need our support. And now what I want to do is to talk to you about what our plans are moving forward. And I'm hoping that I'm going to inspire some of you to think about your work with LGBTQ plus people and what you might be able to do to make things better for them. So um, the key thing that we're working on um, in the next financial year is to launch the first national housing helpline for LGBTQ plus people who need support um, around their housing. Now, this is kind of building upon what we already do. You know that if someone calls us from outside of London, we don't hang up the phone. We work with them and we provide them with support, but we don't have the same level of casework for them. And we don't have the resource to really um, promote this work and make sure that it's happening throughout the whole of the UK. That's what we're focusing on moving forward. One of the things that we want to do is to create a resource directory. So to um, really understand who is already doing this work across the UK, where are people getting LGBTQ plus specific housing support? And actually we've got a tiny little um, link for you to have a look at, because I want to ask you who are these people and start to build that resource directory today. So in the chat function, you'll see there's a, a link to a survey. It's just three questions and it says, do you provide LGBTQ plus specific work? Tell us a little bit about it and who's the best person to contact in your organization. That will be the foundation of this new resource directory that we um, are building. And so I would really encourage everybody to take a moment to do that. Then what we want to do is to really secure some referral pathways both in and out of Stonewall Housing. So if you identify someone that you think needs our help, you and, you and I are going to have a really good relationship where you can refer that person in knowing that they'll get the support they need. And likewise, if we identify someone that might need your support, we'll be able to um, refer out. The other thing I think this helpline will help us with is to identify and evidence LGBTQ plus housing need across the UK. And once we've kind of done that, I think what we're going to do is identify hotspots, you know, like Brighton, for example, might be a particular hotspot or Leeds or Manchester. And when we do that, we want to partner up with people and say, look, we know that there's a lot of LGBTQ plus people that need support in this particular area. Let's work together to make sure that they've got what they need. So that regional partnership is in our planning moving forward. 
And then the last thing that we want to do is, I've written it here as support organizations to come out. And that is a, a saying that I heard from Baroness Barker, um, where what she's saying is that organizations need to come out first so that their staff can come out and their service users can come out and their residents can come out. And so we want to support people to do that as well. So that, you know, this is really in recognition that we know we are not going to be able to work with every single person that needs our help. So what we're going to try and do is help the organizations that do that work to make sure it's LGBTQ plus specific. So I've just got a couple of slides left now. This one is about our vision. So this is the vision of Stonewall Housing. Lesbians, gay men, bi, trans and queer people will live in safer homes without fear of discrimination, violence or abuse. I already know that many of you here today, in fact, probably all of you, share this vision with us. And I want to invite you to come along the journey with us. And in my next slide, I've identified a few things that you could potentially do to help us. So this is this is our building the House of Stonewall. Do you see how, how I've done it with the bricks? So the first line is that foundation that we have, you know, um, you know, the stuff that we already do. The next line is our plans moving forward for the National LGBTQ plus Housing Advice Helpline. And then the next um, layer of bricks is the things that I think you can do with our support. The first one is share good practice. Fill out that little questionnaire that I've sent round. Shout about the LGBTQ plus work you're doing. Tell us about it so we can shout about it and really promote it across the whole of the UK. Um, you can sign up to our um, colleagues house pride pledge and we've got a speaker coming up shortly who'll be able to tell you a bit about that that's a really fantastic way of demonstrating that you're committed to lgbtq plus um issues maybe that's a first step in your journey to coming out we've got a couple of round table events coming up in march that kat's going to tell us about earlier come along get involved we would love to have you there and to really learn from what you're doing to help inform our plans moving forward. Of course, you could commission us to do some specific work for LGBTQ plus res residents. You could work with Tina um, on our inclusion standard and make sure that you're able to demonstrate that um, you're an inclusive um, provider. You could become a champion for us and we could work together to co-create services that we haven't even thought about yet. You know, so I guess the the invitation that I have for you is that we are absolutely determined to make sure that every single LGBTQ plus person across the UK is getting a really well-informed inclusive service. And we know that we can't do it on our own. We want to do it with you. So if you're if you're kind of thinking, yes, this is something we should get involved in. Yes, let's let's get on board with this then please, please get in touch with us. All of our contact details are on our profiles today and Kat will um, send you out some information after the event, but just give us a shout and we'll work together to make it happen. Um, thank you so much for your time today and thank you um, for uh, your ongoing commitment to LGBTQ plus issues. Happy LGBTQ History Month and I'm later we're in a panel for Q&A, so I'll look forward to um seeing you all there. Just before I go, I want to look, um, Rebecca, at the Q&A. Yeah, hopefully Sarah will be able to get that sorted for us in the background um, and we'll be able to get that popped through. I can see a few people putting things into the chat box as well, which is good. So if you have got any questions, if you can jot them down and save them up for, for the panel, that will make that bit um, a lot more interesting as well, if you can save any burning questions, that is. And um, can I just tell you, Rebecca, before I finish, so the number one kind of response to that little survey of how many of your customers are LGBTQ+, plus is I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. And so I think that's a really nice little illustration of the things that we were talking about. Thank you so much, and I won't take up any more time. Thanks, Rebecca. All right. Thanks, Stephen. Great presentation, as always. And for those of you who are looking at the time and thinking it's my poor cherry skills, we do have some time that we've won back later in the day. So it's not complete chaos already, just to reassure people. Um, but I will ask John to join us now. So that's John Stevens, whose um, day role um, working with Clarion is working with Clarion. But then also John is the co-chair of the House Proud 
um, network who have done tons of research and really good work and I can see a few people already John it's almost perfect because they're asking about their staff networking groups and forums that they've set up so amazing introduction um, I'll hand over to you thanks John Thanks, Rebecca. Um, and good morning, everybody. Let me just get my slides set up a second. Um, and they're not showing, which is always a good start. Um, let me just try again. I might need somebody from CIH to present my slides instead, if that's possible. Let me just share my entire screen because that might work better. Nope, that's not working either. This is a typical. Um, this is a typical fail for. Here we go. Thank you very much, whoever's presenting. That's brilliant. Um, so, so good morning, everybody. Um, I'm John Stevens. Um, as was mentioned, I am a Partnerships and Projects Manager for Clarion Futures, and I'm also co-chair of House Proud. Um, so first of all, a little bit about House Proud, a bit of background. Um, House Proud was set up in 2014 as a network group for LGBT people working in social housing. Uh, membership of House Proud is free and simple. Anybody who works in social housing could be a member um, and would just need to send us an email in order to sign up. Um, although membership um, of House Proud is based on individuals rather than organisations, we now have around 60 um, housing providers represented on our mailing list. And this includes uh, housing associations, ALMOs, local authorities and care providers, many of which are represented in, in the conversation today. Um, our aims are to facilitate, facilitate and develop best practice on LGBT issues in, in housing, provide networking opportunities, social events, and to campaign on and for LGBT housing related issues. Um, so specifically, I'm here today to talk about our pioneering No Place Like Home research, which was to understand LGBT experiences in social housing, and also our pledge scheme, um, both of which were developed in association with the University of Surrey. So we can go on to the next slide, that'd be fantastic. Um, no Place Like Home is the largest study of its kind undertaken, um, and we engaged over 300 people in interviews, focus groups, and through surveys. The study aimed to un uncover LGBT residents' experience of social housing and what landlords could do to address any of the issues identified by the research. It was undertaken by the University of Surrey on behalf of House Proud and was funded by six housing associations, which were Clarion, Genesis, Hanover, LNQ, Optivo, and Riverside. Um, and the report um, that we put together was launched at City Hall in February 2018. Um, so the research led to the development of the House Proud Pledge Scheme, which you can see on the right of your screen. Uh, the pledge scheme is something that all social housing providers can sign up to free of charge to demonstrate their commitment to LGBT resident equality and support. Um, so first of all, I'll talk about the research that we undertook, and then I'll talk about the pledge scheme. So if we could go on to the next slide, please. So despite the success of our project, uh, as House Proud, we certainly weren't the first to survey LGBT social housing residents about their experiences. Um, in 2014, for example, a Stonewall Scotland survey of a, a thousand LGBT residents uh, found that one in five expects to be treated worse than heterosexual people when applying for social housing. Our study was also prompted by questions from frontline housing staff and residents about re why residents were asked about their sexual orientation as part of resident profiling surveys, which were required by the regulator at the time. So in response to this, in, in 2015, I worked as a member of the research team at Affinity Sutton and we commissioned the London South Bank University to undertake interviews with people attending a sponsored event at the Metro Centre in Greenwich. The questions that we asked people in that short survey focused on LGBT visibility, discrimination, and residents were also asked about the services offered by their landlord. Um, and we published the findings of that very small scale survey in our report, LGBT Experience of Housing, which you see to the right of your screen. And what we were surprised to learn from that report was that despite the efforts of housing providers to champion LGBT issues, uh, many housing providers in the top Stonewall 100 workplace index, for example, a number of residents expressed serious concerns about the lack of support and possible homophobia from landlords. Um, so the surprising findings from our small study, which undermined our self-image 
that we were champions of LGBT equality and support prompted us to think about um, the need for a sector-wide um, response. So if we could go on to the next slide, please. So as part of efforts to explore options for a sector-wide response, I presented the findings of our small study um, at a house proud meeting and the response that I received from that was overwhelming. So I was inundated with questions as well as comments detailing personal experiences and it was clear that there was enthusiasm to take the work forward and for House Proud to lead on the issue. So together with House Proud mev uh, members, I scoped a research brief and with this was able to raise funding uh, from six housing providers for a project. Um, we were also able to secure Professor Andrew King at Surrey University to deliver the research. Andrew had previously undertaken work to understand the housing options and choices for older LGBT people and reflecting the goodwill from people that we encountered throughout the project, Andrew offered his time um, to work on a project for free. So that all sounds very simple, but I think it took us at least a year to get from the point where I presented at the House Proud meeting to where we had the funding in place, where we were able to secure Andrew as well to, to deliver the research. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, please. Um, so to talk about the No Place Like Home research specifically, um, we followed three clearly defined stages. Uh, so throughout the whole project in stage one, we had um, two user expert consultation panels, um, which enabled the researchers to design the research qu uh, questions and also the collection tools as well. So those were um, resident, a resident consultation panel and also a staff member consultation panel as well. Um, so in stage two, we got into more the meat of the research. Um, so the University of Surrey hosted three focus groups and those were broken down by age, uh, the different age bands were 18 to 24, 25 to 64 and 65 plus. And each focus group, um, there was a mix of different uh, residents by gender and by ethnic background in those focus groups. Um, Francis, our researcher from the University of Surrey, uh, she also undertook mobile interviews with residents um, and that was one-on-one -on -one interviews with a number of residents and the reason it was mobile is that she went to visit them in their homes or in a place where they felt comfortable to talk about their experiences so it might be a local cafe or something like that and then in addition to all of this kind of more qualitative work um, we also had an online survey um, and a paper form survey as well um, which went out to residents and approximately 300 social housing residents completed that survey um, and stage three of, of the work was really about dissemination. Um, so House Proud and the University of Surrey jointly published the No Place Like Home report. And as I said, uh, we launched that at London City Hall. And London City Hall also offered their space for free. So reflecting the goodwill, the, the, the thread that ran through the whole project. So if you go on to the next slide, um, just an overview of uh, some of the key findings from the research. Uh, so mainly, despite the equality laws that are in place, the study found that some LGBT residents did not believe that they had been listened to or taken seriously by their landlords or treated equally. I think that's kind of the headline finding. Um, some, of the, some of the other findings, um, LGBT social housing residents, we found that may modify their home in some way when visited by a housing officer or a repairs person to hide their sexual orientation or gender identity. A significant number of residents worried about their safety and were much less likely to feel a sense of belonging to their neighbourhood than the general population. And this is most pronounced for trans residents. Um, and also LGBT social housing residents wanted their social housing provider to be more proactive on inclusion and to be openly supportive um, of LGBT issues. Um, so that ultimately led to, um, to the pledge scheme work. So, so just a bit more detail on um, some of the findings from our research. Um, so related to safety and belonging, uh, although 78% of survey respondents felt that they lived in a neighborhood, and we're on to the next slide, sorry. 32% um, felt that their neighborhood was not a safe place to live as an LGBT person. Trans residents were less likely to feel safe. 60% uh, of trans residents said that they didn't feel safe. And some of the more, um, quantitative, uh, sorry, the more, some of the more qualitative aspects of the research highlighted some very disturbing experiences of harassment and hate crime for trans residents particularly. 91% um, of trans residents said that they would not feel comfortable having a neighbour in their home 
and some residents reported experience of harassment and abuse from neighbours. Um, yet some of these people felt that housing providers did not deal with this effectively. Only 43% of survey respondents said that they felt a sense of belonging to their um, local area. And this was uh, much less than comparable, comparable national surveys where 80% of social housing residents uh, said that they feel they belong to their neighbourhoods. Uh, trans residents were the least likely to express a belonging to their neighbourhood. So only 23% of trans uh, residents expressed a sense of belonging to their neighbourhoods. Um, and overall, respondents reported feeling excluded in multiple ways, which combined um, gave a sense of, of social isolation. So on to the next slide about hypervigilance and views of social housing providers. Uh, 21% of survey respondents reported that they were uncomfortable having a repairs person entering the home and 24% their housing officer. And we found that women were much less likely to want to let people into their home. Although a minority, as if a significant number of residents reported changing their home environment in some way uh, before these people entered their home to conceal their gender identity or sexual orientation. Um, and this might include moving pictures, books or DVDs. This is more common amongst gay men and other groups. And so one in five gay men responded that they always or most of the time um, hid some of their personal possessions to, to conceal their sexual identity, sexual orientation. Um, survey respondents did not agree that their housing provider was always responsive to their concerns or sensitive to the needs of LGBT people. Um, however, 56% did feel that their housing provider was approachable. So it wasn't all bad in our survey. Um, and residents felt strongly that housing providers should visibly acknowledge um, that their LGBT residents, um, that they wanted to show that they're being treated equal. Um, this included being appropriately represented, represented in policy and tenancy documentation. And 72% of residents thought that it was a good idea to introduce some form of certification for housing providers to show their support for LGBT people. So, on to the next slide about the House Proud Pledge Scheme. Uh, to take forward the momentum and goodwill that we generated from the No Place Like Home research, we once again joined forces with the University of Surrey to develop the House Proud Pledge Scheme. Um, so the scheme is something that all social housing providers can sign up to to demonstrate their commitment to LGBT resident equality and support. Uh, the pledge was developed in association with residents, staff members, and sector leaders from across the country to address the issues raised by No Place Like Home. Um, so we did have a series of workshop, which, workshops with all of those different stakeholders which fed into, into the scheme. Um, so in particular, the pledge scheme addresses the issue of resident trust. It provides a framework for landlords to work with involved residents to take action and to demonstrate their commitment to equality and support. And it also aligns very neatly with the aspirations of the social housing green and white papers as well. Um, so once signed up, housing providers can commit to three core commitments and following the delivery of these, landlords can then work with involved residents on a project to address some of the issues identified by the research. So onto the next, scheme, onto the next slide. Um, work on a scheme was funded by the University of Surrey and four housing associations. Other organizations, including Stonewall Housing and the Greater London Authority were represented in our steering group, as were LGBT residents. Uh, the project kicked off in July 2018 with a meeting of CEOs and senior executives, and they gave us their backing for the project and urged us to be ambitious and to address the issues highlighted by the research. And two further workshops were held with LGBT residents in London and Brighton to identify the priorities. And those residents were very clear that they wanted the scheme to help move housing providers beyond tokenism and to visibly commit to um, taking actions to resolve the issues that everyone felt, felt were there. Um, so finally, a workshop was held with staff members to review the feasibility of the scheme and the proposed options. So onto the next slide. Um, and this just outlines uh, what the, the different aspects of the pledge scheme are. There are two levels of accreditation under the House Proud Pledge Scheme. And once signed up, landlords are expected to deliver three core commitments and report back to House Proud within a year to evidence that these have been achieved. So just a basic outline of, of these three commitments. 
By the end of the first year, we expect landlords to have formal arrangements in place to consult with LGBT residents on an ongoing basis. And we expect landlords to demonstrate how residents can input into decision making. Uh, the second of the commitments, uh, when landlords sign up to the scheme, they receive the House Proud Pledge logo, which we expect to be displayed in resident communications. And that should be accompanied by an explanation on the provider's website about what the scheme means. Uh, we also expect housing providers to publicize the scheme to staff members and to actively support colleagues to develop the commitments. And the final one of the Pledge Pioneer commitments, uh, by the end of the first year, we expect providers to have started rolling out a program of training focusing on LGBT lives. Uh, landlords will need to clearly demonstrate that this training is being rolled out to frontline staff members, including repairs operatives and housing officers. And the reason we said that was because that was a, the particular issue highlighted by, by the research. Um, so once housing providers are able to demonstrate that they've delivered the three core commitments of Pledge Pioneer, um, there's then the option, if landlords choose to, to work towards uh, Pledge Plus. And Pledge Plus is the higher level of accreditation in the scheme. And this requires uh, landlords to work with residents to create a specific project that addresses some of the issues uh, highlighted by the No Place Like Home research. So that's kind of a co-created project with, with involved residents. So just onto the next slide, please. Um, how can my organization sign up to, to the pledge scheme? Well, signing up is free of charge. Um, what you need to do is, is to just send us an email um, and we'll get back in touch with you to confirm some of the details and what those next steps are. Um, once you've signed up, you'll receive a copy of, of the Pledge Scheme logo, which will help you to publicize your involvement in the scheme. Um, and if you look at the House Proud website as well, it hosts a number of resources to, to offer more um, about the Pledge Scheme and also the uh, No Place Like Home research as well. Um, so if you do choose to sign up to the scheme, you'd be in good company. We recently announced the first tranche of housing providers. Um, who have been accredited to the scheme. Uh, we announced that a few weeks ago. Uh, the housing providers that have been awarded Pledge Pioneer status, uh, LNQ, Network Homes, Swan, Home Group, and Notting Hill Genesis. And there are two organizations that have been awarded uh, the Pledge Plus, the higher level of accreditation, and those are Clarion Housing Group and Anchor Hanover. Uh, and since we announced the accreditations a few weeks ago, we've received a number of inquiries uh, from a range of providers about joining the scheme. So as you can see, as, as soon as we get this going, there's, there's kind of a snowball effect with this. Uh, so that concludes my uh, whistle-stop tour of, of the No Place Like Home research and the pledge scheme. So, so thanks for listening to me. And I was gonna say, are there any questions? But I think there's going to be a, a Q&A event later on. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, John. Another great um, presentation. I think some of the the insights from the research there will hopefully stick um, with people and probably sound quite familiar um, as well, especially given the fact that, that lots of the people on the session today will probably be involved in, in supporting LGBTQ people anyway. Um, so John will be back later, so please do, as I said earlier, drop down your questions or pop them um, in the chat or the Q&A and I'll make a note of them for later on when we welcome John back. Um, if we can get John, there we go, he's left the stage, good. Um, we are running slightly behind, but as I mentioned earlier, it is in complete control because we have got a bit of time back now. So we are on to a session now that begins to look at people's lived experience um, as um, LGBTQ+, plus, um, with housing and also homelessness as well, which has been touched on in Stephen's presentation earlier on. We were due to be joined by Lucia Fitzgerald and Angela Cooper, um, but due to some technical issues, what they've had to do is pre-record an interview for us with the glamorous Kat Haldane, who managed to play host to them um, yesterday afternoon. So if there are any questions in particular for Lucia and Angela following on from the session, then we can put you in touch with them. They're always really keen um, to share their experiences as well. So hopefully what shall happen now is that we'll magically see a video appear um, with Kat hosting, speaking to Lucia and Angela about their experiences, and then I'll come back on to invite Corey onto stage um, as well, who's one of the House of Stonewall ambassadors. So, Sharon or Sarah, if you could press play. Hi, everyone. Um, 
Brilliant. Hopefully, I know a couple of people were mentioning they had some sound issues, so I'll just put the link to the video in there for people to, to catch that afterwards or watch it perhaps in the networking break that will follow um, the end of this session. Um, really, really powerful. And I know, you know, when I first heard Lucia and Angela speak and I watched their film Invisible Women, it's, it's hard to actually hold it together when you hear that. Um, and I think, you know, probably, you know, what we're about to hear now will really hopefully hit home for people as well. So I've been joined again by Kat, who's going to introduce Corey, um, who's one of the ambassadors of the House of Stonewall. So I'll hand over to you, Kat. Thanks, Bex. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, and I hope that you're already getting a lot out of the session. I just wanted to say that talking to those incredible women was such a, a privilege yesterday. Um, and it really hit home that, you know, touching on what Stephen said earlier, this had this happened last week, you know, this, these, these experiences that Lucia had at 15 years old fleeing Manchester, uh, fleeing Ireland to, uh, to find a better life in Manchester um, and the horrific ordeal that she experienced along the way these things are still happening now and, and that's what Stonewall Housing helps to do is, is to hold the hands of LGBTQ plus people who are homeless or, ex or about to be made homeless and help them navigate that pathway through. Um, so it is now my great pleasure to introduce um, an amazing ambassador of ours um, who is... His name's Corey P. Um, he is a poet, actor and facilitator in his own right. He's been commissioned um, and published by the likes of the BBC, the National Youth Theatre, the National Theatre, the Lyrics, Organics and the Barbican. He's one of our founding ambassadors for the House of Stonewall. Uh, and now an alumni, uh, as an alumnus, he champions the work that we do by raising awareness, um, by uh, helping us with fundraising initiatives, um, and he's here today to talk to you about his experiences of living and working in Stonewall Housing. So, hand over to you, Corey. Um, hi, um, my name is Corey P. Corey Peterson, and yeah, I am a House of Stonewall ambassador. And I'm actually really nervous about doing this um, because Stonewall Housing like means so much to me and they, they've helped me so much and they've helped people I care about <laughs> um, loads too. And I don't, the, the best way I can explain to you of the power of Stonewall Housing and everything that they're talking about and saying is by, yeah, sharing a few of my experiences. So just a bit brief bit about me. So I was homeless between the ages of 13 and 24 years old um, and I basically had to leave home at 13 um, because of the my relationship with my bi biological father um, a quite abusive relationship um, and yeah I, I didn't trust for various reasons your know, for at the time I wasn't really raised to you know, wasn't in communities that um, usually um, where you're told to or where you're made to feel like you can. I um, grew up in a place like Tottenham and Hackney and places like that. And and yeah, so I left home and saved my grandma. Um, and then she moved away and I found myself having to couch surf with different family and friends. And for the first five years, that's all it was. There were only three nights in that period where I had nowhere to sleep. I worked really hard. I started getting to McDonald's at um, 4 a.m. in the morning, partially because it was um, my closest thing to solace at the time. I couldn't afford to buy the food there, but I could sit there, do my work, listen to music, just be in my own space and head. Um, and I ended up getting 18 GCSEs, um, a Fulbright scholarship to an American university, somehow, um, and where I was double majoring in neuroscience and theater and dance. And my mental health went into decline. I missed my mom, my brother, my family. Um, and I asked the university to allow me to study abroad, but in London, at home, <laughs> um, um, at UCL with someone called Sarah Jane Blakemore. Um, I tried to make it work staying at home again, but it was a life-threatening situation. It was worse than it had been at times in the past um, due to threats 
to my life with my father, um, physical abuse and emotional abuse. So I found myself sleeping rough and in other environments for quite a decently long period of time. Now, um, then at this point, I would as my mental and, and physical health started to go into decline. Um, and I found somewhere called New Horizons to refer me on to an emergency temporary accommodation, then an emergency night by night service, um, and into eventually Stonewall Housing. Um, and yeah, just a bit about how my sexuality and like identity played into it. Now, I can't say categorically um, that it was the only thing that did because I'm not in my father's head, basically. But what I can say is he grew up in Jamaica and um, one thing that was an aspect of my life at home was I just, whenever I tried to express myself or live out loud in a sense, um, I was punished for it. Um, I came from a household within which I was persecuted for just being me. And I was driven away from the people that I care about most in the world from my life um, because I wasn't accepted as an individual within the home. It just felt safer to be away from it. And I, yeah, I couldn't stay there even at 13 years old. Um, and in terms of the communities I grew up in, places like Tottenham, Hackney, and the cultures and the groups that I was raised within, um, it didn't feel completely safe to completely uh, explore myself and my identity um, within those. It, ignorance is bliss, be seen and not heard, be a man, toxic masculinity, it exists. <laughs> um, and yeah, I am a man and I am who I am but I didn't really have a space to explore who I was and before I had that space I didn't without the ability to explore who I was I didn't know exactly how to help myself because how can you if you don't know yourself right um but when I moved into stone housing that all changed it was a crucial point in my life and my experiences um just before um I um, found Stonewall Housing, I've been offered a job, £90 an hour, success skills seminars, um, and yeah, I had to turn it down, and all I would have had to do is like, yeah, just memorise a few things for the session, do a few things, yeah, it's right down my street, £90 an hour, oh, got lush, and I've never had problems getting jobs in previously, but my mental health being in the client, I just didn't have the capacity to. That same year, I was diagnosed with complex PTSD, severe anxiety and severe depression. And people like Jenny, the mental health advocate at Stonewall Housing, um, a key worker, Kat, like just Kat, someone called Karis, um, everyone there, they really helped me. A, they gave me a space in which I felt as though I could be myself. Um, B, I was surrounded by an immediate community, a, a tribe, um, um, a fan of people who shared common experiences and well on a basic level they gave me a, my own room with a lock on the door <laughs> and that counted for a lot um, while sleeping rough there were a different, whole different arena of um, experiences let's say um, which led to my diagnosis with complex PTSD. And one thing that I really struggled with was A, to feel settled. Um, and they give me constant reassurance. Um, they were always there when I became defensive, when I got a bit too much, as I think I was a lot of the time. Um, but they also, somehow I was able to trust them. And I was literally clinically diagnosed with things that reduced my ability to do so. Um, I had to diminish. When I arrived, I, I was just sat trembling in corners. I had this big red blanket um, and I would just hide. I would just hide. I couldn't communicate with people. My social anxiety was through the roof. Um, and slowly I moved on to achieving things that would have been hard to achieve if I hadn't had um, some of those experiences. I, um, yeah. They, they, they came with me to appointments. They helped me through um, sorting through the benefits and systems that I needed to 
get through and navigate. And when I didn't feel as though I could advocate for myself or talk on my own behalf, or even at times when I felt I was trying to, but I wasn't being heard or listened to, they spoke on my behalf and then they empowered me to continue doing it myself when I could. Um, and aside from that, beyond all of that, they gave me and my friends, um, friends that I will have and cherish for life, opportunities for creative expression as well. Um, and that played a crucial role in my progress and recovery too. Um, and yeah, at, at this moment in time, I, as of 2019, I moved into a long-term um, move on. So my own flat, imagine, oh my gosh, 11 years. <laughs> 11 years coming, but finally there. And I played a part after that in however small the roles were or the parts were in shows at the, at the National Theatre. And even with Steve McQueen on his recent Small Axe project. And at this moment in time, um, with the therapy I'm doing, the, the bits of training I'm doing, everything I'm doing, there's an opportunity for my dreams to come true. None of that would have been possible without single housing. But what's more than that, I might not be alive if it weren't for the support they gave me at the time where I needed it the most. Um, and yeah, but even since having moved out of hostels and into my own property, they've helped me with resettlement. Like the nature of move on for me was that um, I didn't know which borough I would be moved into. And when I got moved into a certain borough, it, it was like the keys were there, your tendency starts. And there was this big rush to get me um, to transition into the independent living away from the hostel and the community that I'd found within the hostel, the family. Um, and into independent living and just to get myself like white goods and a bed to sleep on and stuff like that and they worked around the clock with what little time they had and with the big case workload that they had and with their own lives and um just to get me those things and I, they've done the same for as i say people i care about friends people who are considered family um and they worked tirelessly, non-stop. They um, put me in contact with a resettlement worker to um, support me with certain things that wouldn't have been offered in the um, hostels, but were relevant to the move on option um, and independent living and things I needed to work on. And even at a time where they are not obligated to help me, they do. Um, and yeah, now I'm part of the House of Stonewall. And um, there is one of my the things I'm most proud of. So yeah, yeah. Um, now having come from a place where I was persecuted for being who I was, where I couldn't live out loud, where I learned to internalize all the things the world seemed to say about me into an environment where I was celebrated for being who I was, where I felt safe, where I felt like I was surrounded by people who shared those same experiences and which validated my experiences um, in a certain sort of way, which gave me connection, um, a reason to keep going, motivation, all of those things, as I say, saved my life. So right now, like all I can ask for you to do is listen to these people. Um, that's really as simple as it is. They need more money because the amount, the amount that they do for people like me and for people with experiences similar to mine, with what little time they have and what little resources they have, they just deserve more, but also more people need access to this service. As I say, this is not a service that can just empower you and give you the means to help turn your life around and change your life and grow into the person you are and who you deserve to be. This is also beyond that, an organization um, that helps to save lives and spread the word. <laughs> because if that's not enough reason to, then I, I don't know what could be, to be honest. Um, and that's, that's, that's me, that's, that's me, Corey P. Um, yeah, and thank you, Stonewall Housing. Um, yeah.
Roy, that that was insane. Thank you so much. And I can't even imagine like how much kind of courage it takes to like come and speak about that you know given what you've gone through and I think it's just so important because there'll be so many other people now that were you 11 years ago that are going to be hearing that that just get blown away by what you've said so thank you so much and you can see you're getting loads of like virtual high fives high tens everything in the chat so like you're like you've got a fan club now which is amazing <laughs> so that's all I've got to bring you back for the panel after this break but um I, th I hope that everybody that's listened to Lucia, Angela and Corey can really see the impact and, you know, just get even a tiny bit of insight into what people from the LGBTQ plus community experience, whether it's growing up, you know, whatever. And I think some of the stats as well that you'll hear from Stephen as well, like I think it's something crazy, like 70 percent or over 70 percent of people that go through their services come from a BAME background as well and I think that that speaks to some of the stuff you mentioned Corey that so many like young people and you know older people are really struggling to live out loud which I think is a great a great way to kind of phrase it so thank you Corey and um, everyone please can um, you save your questions as well for, for the panel but what we thought would be really good now given how um, hard hitting and emotional that might be it might just be me that's kind of feeling emotional after that to take a break um, you will bounce back onto your table, so you'll have a chance to meet loads of different people, share your experiences, share what you're doing, share your challenges, um, everything like that. And then if we can join back, probably at 12 o'clock, so if we take a half an hour break, we'll let you know when we're coming back. Grab a tea, a coffee, um, grab a wee if you need to as well, and then we'll come back at 12 o'clock where we'll be joined by all of our speakers again to ask all of the questions that I'm sure you've built up over the course of this morning. Thanks, everyone in the chat but I think we said we'd start back at, at 12 with us finishing the last session a bit earlier so hopefully um, those of you that have nipped off will hear me saying hello again um, and come back and I will fill two minutes of time um, to give you a chance to run back from the kitchen. Um, I think hopefully all of you will agree that um, so far the sessions this morning have been completely inspirational whether that be you know hearing about the current state and some of the the kind of statistics and things that, that go into the background of all of this but then also those moving stories that we heard um, not that long ago before the break from Corey, Lucia and Angela. Um, as I said we would have loved to have had Lucia and Angela joining us as part of our panel as well but technology wasn't our friend yesterday so um, what we are going to be doing is inviting John, um, Stephen and Corey back to the stage um, and this is your chance really to ask as many questions that you've been building up, any comments. Um, I know one person earlier did have their hand raised so um, if they are still keen to come back on stage please do put your hand back up again or keep it up if it's still up and we will bring you on stage and then your camera and microphone will turn on and you're able um, to ask your question but you will be part of the recorded session that's the only caveat so if you're screen shy best to type your question in the chat and if not then pop your hand up and we'll invite you on stage in our virtual limo um, so without further ado if we could welcome John, Stephen and Corey back to the stage I've got a couple of questions already um, for us to start going through there we go John's found his way back hi John hi. <laughs> Oh, we can see hands flying up already. This is brilliant. Hi, Corey. And then we hopefully Stephen will be back with us any second now. Amazing. Right. OK, great. So thanks for joining us again, guys. And again, thanks for your presentations earlier today. Um, you're going to be put on the spot, hopefully not too much by our audience. But one of the things that I thought would be really powerful for us all to think about just to introduce this bit. Um, one of our former presidents used to say that as a housing professional, you can do more for somebody in a day than what a lot of other people can do in a whole lifetime. So when you start thinking about these issues that we've discussed and you hear the experiences and things, housing can have such a transformative impact on people's lives. And I think you really felt that when Corey was speaking. So you can do things as a housing organisation, as a housing professional, and hopefully today, We'll signpost you to some really good resources, training, support, accreditations and things that you can get involved in that will really help people in the future. Um, so in no particular order, um, I can see that Kim has got her hand up. So if we could bring Kim onto the stage to join our lovely panel. Hopefully she's hot putting it up onto stage. 
this is always a moment of suspense. I wish we had a drum roll or something. Yeah. I should have probably pre-warned people as well that my dog Ralph likes to join panel discussions as well. And if my Amazon delivery comes earlier than I'm expecting, we could all be in trouble. So I will mute myself <laughs> in case. Kim, I think you're with us, but you haven't got the camera on, but if we can try and hear you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely fantastic morning. I've learned so much in this whole session. I just cannot tell you. I wish I could express it. Um, I just wanted to raise the issue of, um, I'm from the black community, and I wanted to raise the issue of, um, are, you know, there being still um, prevalent issues around lesbian, gay, um, bisexual um, and trans groups within the community. Who are you trying to move forward working with the black community to address those issues you know corey um presented brilliantly around um some of those issues and being very careful about what he said which i really appreciate but i just wanted to know how how we are um moving forward as a group that's a great question thank you kim stephen if we could come to you first because i did quote one of your statistics i hope correctly earlier um that over 70 percent of people you work with come from vain backgrounds so I'll, I'll hand over to you and then i don't know if corey's got anything more to add to it yeah thanks um Bex. yeah so it's really interesting for us because do you remember i was talking about over representation of lgbtq plus people in homelessness then yes. we also see an overrepresentation of black and minority ethnic people within that cohort as well. So the stat, um, Rebecca, you got it almost right. The the stat is that we we work with about twelve hundred people per year, and fifty percent of those are black and minority ethnic people. Then when you look in our accommodation services, so if you kind of hone in to the people that actually come and live with us, that stat jumps up to seventy seven percent. So yeah, over seventy percent. And so there's this real overrepresentation of um, black and minority ethnic people who need support around LGBTQ plus homelessness um, and housing issues. And so we have to try and figure out what, wh why is that happening? And I think, Corey, you did a really good job of, of helping us understand what some of the family dynamics might be like um, whenever you come from a black and minority ethnic background. I mean, it's different for every family, isn't it? But there's there's some themes that can kind of run through. Um, so there's something about really understanding why that's the case. Why are these groups overrepresented? And then for us at the at Stonewall Housing, and particularly with the House of Stonewall, it's about finding ways for people to share their stories and tell us what it's like. So that's why we invite people to come along to our events and to, you know, to tell people what it's really like to be LGBTQ+, to be Black and minority ethnic, and to have these additional kind of vulnerabilities or challenges around housing and homelessness. So we we very much see that as our um, our responsibility to champion and to provide a platform for people to share that voice. The other thing that we do is work in partnership with um, specific uh, BAME uh, organisations and to really find ways to work in partnership. So, um, the, you know, to find a, a, an opportunity for our service users to get, get some specific support or find an opportunity for our service users to help people understand their experiences as well. There's so much work that needs to be done, number one, in understanding it, and then number two, in being able to really move it forward. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Corey, have you got anything that you want to add completely up to you? I'm not going to put you on the spot. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, jumping off that, um, uh, yeah, I do feel like um, uh, sharing more more openly um, is, uh, is a big thing within this as well, because I feel like, do you know what, right, it's very, when you come from certain um, areas and backgrounds or you've had certain backlash before, or you're just um, uncomfortable. I, I feel like within the, um, I mean, with, within many groups of people and the whole LGBT community, but um, in in different um, ways, but especially within the black community, being black and LGBT, um, um, there is this sense of, um, there, 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 there is a lot of reason to feel like you need to turn down certain things and to feel like you need to hide in certain ways or, what not and i feel like do you know what one person i really love um is is someone called monroe bergdorf right 
partially because she is so open and vocal and she's so willing to be seen and she just leads by example and you know what it's hard because she does get a lot of backlash herself and stuff like that but um she's a lovely human being and I actually met her at one of the Stonewall, House of Stonewall events and I feel like um the more we share our stories and the more we we the more visible um we will become the more it will have a domino effect effect and knock-on effect and the more conversations will be sparked within certain communities about things which which um pertain to like feeling persecuted or things that anyone may have internalized and the more conversations start and we can just confront the issues head on and we can um normalize just being there and being seen um the more we'll progress and stuff like that does that answer your question i feel like do you know corey and stephen it does because i think that um as a group of people we have to be visible we have to be out there and we have to speak the truth in a very respectful way because we don't want to cause to offense but we have to to speak the truth and um and i think that there are lots of issues which go back i I'm, I'm not going to talk about them openly but if i was just speaking to you on your own corey i'd probably have a long chat or Stephen. but um thank you that was really good thank you for sharing do you know um rebecca just to add to that discussion and particularly thinking about munro's experience corey because she gets a lot of backlash simply for being herself a black yeah. person who is trans and this week, I think she's had to come off Twitter because of the amount of abuse that she experiences consistently every single day where she's actually said, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to just remove myself from that because in that kind of, um, you know, her pursuit of being visible and being able to really put herself out there has had a detrimental effect on her mental health and subsequently on her life. And so that's the reality that some people are facing whenever they're trying to live their authentic lives yes Absolutely. thank you thank you so much for coming up onto stage kim no problem right hopefully sharon or sarah there we go kim's gone um maureen i think you were next so maureen is from hdn um so the housing diversity network if we can have maureen pop up on stage fingers crossed It's a long way to the stage. Most people are at the back, they've got a long way to come. There we go. Hi, Maureen, welcome. Hi there, everyone. Um, Hi, I'm a little bit surprised, but delighted. I had no idea that I'd put myself forward to <laughs> be on stage, but here we are, I'm gonna go with it. Um, so firstly, I want to say thank you to Corey and all the other speakers who are opening up our minds. I think education is so important in any sphere of discrimination and persecution. That's the first thing I want to say. But in particular, when somebody opens up their heart and expresses themselves from the heart, you have to give so much respect because it's not the done thing in any sphere of life. So hopefully your messages, Corey, are hitting home. I did feel, um, because of who you are and your background, the fact I went to school in Tottenham, um, I was born in North London. Um, what else can I say? You can see who I look like. Uh, um, one thing that was running through my mind is um, the relationship between racism in general, because when I'm talking about, when we talk about racism in different, different spheres, I often find myself saying, well, actually, this includes people who are black and trans. It's not just you know, black and minority ethnic. There are people who have other identities as well. So when you're talking about racism, to me, it includes people. It's not exclusive. So I'm wondering what you think, anybody on the panel, but Corey in particular, how does um, your view about structural racism affect what happens to people who are LGBT, LGBTQ plus as well as being black or minority ethnic? How do you make sense of that relationship? Because my view is structural racism affects all BME people. And for me, that's where I start <laughs> when I'm trying to understand what's going on. So in relation to you, I'm thinking, OK, um, there's the individual experience of your family, but there's also your wider experiences of being a member of at least two 
minority groups, if that makes sense. So how do you make sense of those? Hopefully you're following me, Corey, because I'm just making this yeah. up on the spot. Because <laughs> I wasn't expecting you to be called. I hope that you're following what I'm trying to say. And do you have anything to comment on that? And anybody else? Thanks, Maureen. Corey, shall we start with you? Yeah. Um, I think there's a sense, obviously, um, like, um, being marginalised in, in, in the more ways in which, you, or reasons for which you're marginalised, um, the more <laughs> marginalisation there is, and, and so it becomes hard. But I think there's something um, within the fact that you can feel isolated from, as, as someone who, who's Black and LGBT, right? And given the fact that within some, within certain parts of the Black community, that they're, they're still, for various reasons, um, people who either don't agree with, um, but in, in all walks of life, um, no matter who you are, but um, people who don't agree with being LGBT or don't understand it maybe, or um, who have um, some sort of in, internalised views about, about that. Um, there are parts over the recent year where we where we've come to stand up and fight about different things like um the george floyd murder and 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 stuff like that and there were sub conversations whereby not just with lgbt people but with um uh with women and whereby there was a sense that um there was a sense that when people were, were trying to say, okay, I'm fighting, fighting for, um, well, some people, not all, in all cases, but I'm fighting for black lives. They, they didn't want to include trans people or LGBT people or women or, uh, and being isolated within, so being part of the black community and then being isolated by certain people within it, not always, things have gotten better, but within certain people within it, can um, give this sense of, um, I, I, I guess maybe even indignance, um, because you cannot, essentially, like we're all human beings, right? We all, our hearts work the same, we believe the same, we all feel the same emotion, we go through different experiences where we all feel the same emotion. And so when you're marginalized for multiple aspects of your identity, um, it, it becomes a, hard to deal with, but when you are marginalized um, within communities um, that you should, be, that you feel like you should be part of the community with, within or like, you should feel at one with. Um, it is easy to feel as though you have even more isolated, basically, like you have no place to go, if that makes sense. Um, and so, can I go back to the original question? I don't know if I'm actually answering what has been. Oh. Hey, look, Corey, I think similar in that we're lateral thinkers. I'm trying to join so many dots. I'm, I'm turning myself inside out. But I was trying to move away from, not disrespectfully, but to work towards, you know, the bigger picture about the system in which we're all living under and how the um, institutions, the structure of, of our society operates to oppress a lot of people without us even being mm. aware of it it's just how um and i guess i am making a point of you know asking your opinion about my opinion about the whole and how important the whole is to the individual experience so i recognize as a fellow black person that my individual experience is very hot for me equally um I'm thinking that real change won't happen unless you look at the whole, which is oppressive to people who are not mainstream. So if you're not part of the mainstream way of doing things, for whatever reason, um, unless we start to dismantle that, the individual experiences are going to continue. Some of it will get better, like you say, but the whole picture is not moving 
that well. And, and ironically, I would put it to you, and I know this is controversial, that if there is hostility, and I'm generalizing here, within the black community around the history of an LGBTQ plus, I'm trying to get the whole sentence in, around individuals, I also think that's an effect of racism too. That when people are persecuted, for one thing, they lash out around other things. That's my, I don't know where that comes from, but that's my sort of instinct telling me that. But when people are liberated and have um, the space to be themselves in one respect, they tend to be more magnanimous and generous to other people because they've sorted themselves out. And I think that, so hence, ironically, I think the backlash that you've talked about, I also feel is an, is, um, an effect of racism, if you follow me, itself, because people are scrabbling around to exist, you know, shelter, food, COVID-19, you know, <laughs> I haven't got the time to be kind or thoughtful about other issues. Do you see what I'm saying? So I think it's yeah. an effect of racism. That's what I'm saying. I yeah, and just jumping up what you said, like there you spoke about liberation, right? And I think like one thing that is really needed is we need to normalize celebration more. And when we celebrate um individuals and authenticities and everyone in there just yeah, people generally, um, and we give them the safe spaces in which to be fully themselves, um, and which can also act as a as some solace away from areas in which there might be some backlash um then what happens is is we stop thinking about all these we stop thinking about um different aspects of the person we start thinking about people as a whole we start just taking people for who they are and i feel like do you know what there, there are there are times in which like certain things will happen and in those moments like you have to choose to focus on one thing at a time and it doesn't diminish any of the other things um but it's like for instance i was having a conversation so basically i i joined i was became a youth trustee for an organization last year and before um and i was trying to talk to them and i had to um come at it from a perspective of like what is my identity what things um about my identity can i Add perspective, give perspective to and help them develop um, further progress in terms of like representing people from those different. So obviously me being LGBT was a thing, me being black was a thing and some of the things I asked for, they for whatever reason, because they have so much focus on that they weren't, some of the things I was pushing weren't, um, weren't the most important things to work on at the time. And then when the George Floyd murder happened, suddenly there was an email saying, oh, well, um, so uh, at this state, you said this, this and this and that. And we have to talk to you more about this now. And there was a sense of like, oh, OK, so someone has to die in order for you to. But there was also a sense of there's so much that we could work on as a society and as a nation. And there's so much there's so much progress to be made in different areas that I had a conversation with someone and there was a general feeling is as to be fair to be fair that at that point it was a very specific moment in time where the focus was what very and yet they should have cared about it before that happens and it's not that they didn't but um in certain moments we will have we will have to just say we're focusing on this or we're focusing on that to be honest, but I think if we normalize celebration more and liberating people just to, I'm rambling, I'm so sorry, but um, yeah, I, I think that could help too. <laughs> Look, as a fellow rambler, um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Rebecca. No, I think you're trying to reach out. Thank you. I'm, I'm, on that note, I'm taking my camera off so no you can worries. move on. Thank you thank so much, you. Corey. Thank you. Love you. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Um, I think we'll, we'll try and bring John in in a second. I think a few of these questions coming up will be um, to do more with what we can do as organisations as well. We've got um, a couple more hands up there. So if we could ask Teresa to join us, hopefully Teresa is prepared to, um, to be on stage. <laughs> it won't be too much of a shock if we could ask um, Teresa to come up. Hi, thank you, Rebecca. Can Hi, you hear Chris. me? 
Yes, we can. Go okay, ahead. I have tried to share my camera, but it seemed to be preventing me. So apologies for that. That's That's fine, don't worry. Um, fantastic discussion so far. Thank you so much for hosting and organising and um, supporting all these conversations. I wanted to pick, on, pick up on something Stephen was saying right at the very beginning, because my interest comes from um, as a dementia researcher at the University of Worcester. I was really interested in some of the research that Stephen was talking about. And also our conversations about the isolation, the stigma and the layers of complexity that come within the discussions we've been having today. Um, so really what I wanted to pick up on was Stephen spoke about the increase in people over the age of 55 who'd been coming forward for information, advice, etc. And I'm just thinking about if uh, we were talking just um, a moment ago about these different identities and the amount of stigma. So for people with dementia, for example, when they receive a diagnosis, over half of them lose their friendship groups, lose members of their family because families don't understand the dementia. So if we're looking at that older adult community within our housing sector, we're going to find people with these different levels of identity, levels of complexity. So I just wondered whether Steve and John or Corey or yourself, Rebecca, had come across any kind of figures, research or working with people with dementia within your communities. Thank you, um, Teresa. John, just so um, we're not completely um, leaving you out of the panel, I know you talked about the no place like home research um, that you did. And I know that had a couple of the different demographics in there, but you know, from your experience working with organisations, what have you kind of come across when it, it comes to that, you know, older age category? Um, yeah, so, so in terms of our research, we, we didn't pick up on dementia specifically, but I am aware that there are a number of different initiatives in the housing sector that relate to dementia, right? So, so there are accreditations, I think, that, that are kind of dementia specific. I mean, I did, I did just want to pick up on your point around stigma as well, and, and the way that we set up our pledge scheme to relate quite specifically to the social housing green paper and as a response to that of involving residents and of kind of reducing stigma um and i think there's, there's now a gap between where we were with the social housing green paper which was published a couple of years ago with the social housing white paper where we are now which is a lot more focused on kind of you know holding housing associations to account rightly but it's also about viewing people as customers and things as well so so the narrative of where we were when we started off with the pledge scheme to where we are now has kind of changed slightly. And I, I think that's quite interesting in terms of when you talked about stigma, it's just something that came, that came to my mind with that. Thank you, John. Um, Stephen, some of the, the stats that you mentioned, and if Lucia had have been here, I'm sure she'd have been shouting from the rooftops about this because she's working quite a lot um, with the uh, over 55 community. But um, I don't know if there's anything to, to add, Stephen, to what you said earlier. There's um, a really lovely piece of research that we were working in partnership on with Tonic Housing and Opening Doors, and that was looking specifically at the housing needs of LGBTQ plus people over 55. And it was um, uh, published last year. If you if you have a look for it, it's called Building Safe Choices. And actually, Rebecca, I've sent you a link to it, so I'll um, we can share it for everybody as well. And I don't remember the stats off the top of my head. I'm sorry I haven't prepared them for today. But what that was very clearly saying was that older people needed um, the same level of housing advice that some of our younger people are able to access. And as, as a result of that, one of the pledges that we made was that we would um, develop our older people service. So not specifically around dementia, but definitely that understanding that um, as as we get older and as that particular generation, there's a there's a cohort of a few generations who are getting older and don't have families. You know, a lot of LGBTQ plus people now have got children, don't they? And that wasn't always the norm. Um, whenever, for example, some of these people grew up when being gay and being well, being lesbian wasn't recognized and being gay was illegal, you know. And so here they are now finding themselves in the later stages of their lives without a family network to provide support. Um, often there's a link between loneliness and older LGBTQ plus people. And so again, I wonder, I don't know this, but I wonder about how that filters in with some of the work that you're looking at around dementia. 
So I would really encourage you to have a look at that report, Building Building Safe Choices. I think it's called Building Safe Choices 2020 because there was another one we did a few years ago. And if you haven't already, link in with Tonic Housing, an amazing organisation that are specifically working at retirement communities for LGBTQ plus people and Opening Doors, who specifically work with older LGBTQ plus people around social inclusion. They do loads of stuff, but that's a kind of a nice way of kind of uh, talking about the work that they do. So yeah, there is some work and I'm sure there's more to be done. And I'd be really interested in having conversations with you about how we might be able to feed into that. Thank you both. And thank you, Rebecca, for facilitating that. And not to leave Corey out, you were amazing. <laughs> <laughs> thank thanks, you. Thank you both. Thanks for coming up, Teresa. All thank right. You. Thanks, thanks, Rebecca. Bye, everyone. Right. And I'm going to try and smoothly bring Martin onto stage. So where we've only got 15 minutes left um, of our panel discussions. Hopefully, Martin will be joining us on stage. There we are. Welcome, Martin. Nice to meet you. <laughs> right. So I'm from Stockport Homes, uh, just outside Greater Manchester. So one of two questions, really, uh, since I heard the discussion between Maureen and Corey. My first question is, how important do you think it is for a company um, to have an LGBTQ specific logo during history and pride? Because I heard somebody say an organisation needs to come out first before they expect their staff and customers to come out. And then my second one, just to put in there, um, thoughts around equality or inequality around intersectionality and that's coming off the back of the speak that Corey just had with Maury and listening to how he feels in his LGBT self he might find more over his, his BAME life do you know what I mean so what are your thoughts on there so I'll leave it with you cool thanks Marty if we start with the first half of that that question I think it's probably one more for John and Stephen um, to come back on with some of the accreditation, training um, and pledge work that we do. So if we start with, with John, then come Stephen and then let Corey have a think about the second half of that question, if that's OK. So, yeah, over to you, John. Um, yeah, no, no, it really touches on where we came to with the pledge scheme and, and visibility was so important um, in all of our discussions with residents and how important it is for a housing providers to be visible, which is why it became one of our kind of core principles underpinning the pledge pioneer um, part of the pledge scheme. Um, and, and I think it, it kind of suffuses for everything as well. So, so I know that the, um, from a house prayer perspective, we think it's so important, um, which is why we do try and attend so many different prides across uh, the uh, country. So we have our bus when we're allowed to have a bus, at a London pride. And um, then we also go to kind of some more regional prides and things as well, and also UK black prides. Um, and then also from, from a um, clarion perspective, um, we find it so useful. So, so in uh, LGBT History Month things, we do change our Twitter logo to our LGBT um, clarion logo. Um, and then also to have that really visible at Pride. And then we get so much good feedback from being involved in Brighton Pride, for example, that it just, you know, it, 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 it pays for itself. It, it's, it's the right thing to do, basically. Great. Thanks, John. Stephen? And I absolutely agree. Visibility, I think, is key. The thing that I would just caution people against is, have you heard of the term pride washing, where yeah. companies kind of, you know, all of a sudden come out with their LGBT, you know, logo, and that's kind of it. Do you remember um, Marks and Spencer's brought out their LGBT sandwich one yeah. year? They, <laughs> you know, like, so there's this kind of, um, there's, there's that pride washing thing. I think people just have to be careful of. You know, and I would say that if you're using a pride logo, you have to understand what it means for LGBTQ plus people. When I go into a, an organization, a supermarket, a pub, wherever I'm going, if I see the pride flag, I immediately know that I'm welcome here. That's what it means. You know, like so whenever whenever we say to our service users, this place is for you. That's one way that we can do it by, by demonstrating the Pride logo. Um, I would say though, organizations that do that have to follow it up with um, training for their staff. They have to look at their policies, make sure they're inclusive. Some organizations have policies that are not inclusive at all of the LGBTQ plus um, organ, uh, their staff, but they do have this gorgeous Pride flag at the front of their, um, their, their, their building or on their Twitter or whatever. So I think you, you have to be really cautious of that, but 
visibility is so important. I wish we could encourage every single organization in the whole country, not just housing, John, but you know, housing is where we should be starting. But I want every shop to have a sign on the window that says, if you're gay, if you're lesbian, if you're bisexual, whatever, 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 this shop is for you. And we will not put up with any kind of discrimination. If someone commits a crime against you in this shop, they will be arrested. We will report them to the police. You know, that's what I want the whole country to, to be like. And I think a really good place for us to start is by, you know, working with our colleagues in housing and saying, demonstrate to your customers that this place is for them. And yeah, that journey of coming out, I think, is one that um, is really important. And one that the House Pride, House Pride Pledge is a really fantastic thing for you to do. Getting some training with an organisation like Stonewall Housing, you know, having a look at our um, inclusion standard, all that stuff can help you on that journey as you go through it. We are part of House Proud Northwest, by the way. Uh, so oh, yeah, yeah, we have signed up to the pledge and I completely get it with all the back office stuff, policies and things. I think we're, stop what homes, I think they're really forefront in all of that stuff. I think we're just a bit slow up on the uptake of the, the logo, shall we say, like the rainbow logo. But I think you're right in regards to pride washing and that stupid sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody's a fan of the sandwich then yeah. the that, that went down a treat um just bringing it to the second half of martin's question if you can remember corey and if not we can ask martin just to go through it again but question about again off the back of what maureen was saying really about how lots of these things overlap and how that kind of affects your experiences i guess of going through things but Yeah, I, and I just like to say, like, all of us, like, uh, all of us have so many dimensions to us, right? And I just wanted to comment. And when when, when I was talking earlier, I didn't want it to, to seem as though I felt um, less in tune with any other side of me, whether that be my black heritage or anything else. It's just today um, I'm talking more about uh, LGBT sides. And I feel like what I was more saying is that sometimes then there are times at which like certain aspects of our identities can be at loggerheads um, um based on uh various factors right and we, we are placed in boxes usually based on a single dimension whatever comes to light at the time and um as opposed to being like evaluated or appreciated on holistically uh, partially usually in, in a lot of cases because you unite we we aren't aware or in detail of each other's experiences or what it, what all of the things that we identify with or whatever. So in certain moments, like, because I know, fun fact, but I'm actually Jewish by heritage, you know? So at one point when I was staying in, in St. Newton, I walked down the street and um, there, some of the like, um, more orthodox, orthodox Jewish community, like there'd be times where they crossed the street as soon as they saw me coming. And there was one occasion where I did say, I'm Jewish too, so I don't know where you're going. But um, I feel like that's why, especially with intersectionality, I think that's why we need to, we're very, um, as a society, as, uh, in terms of the media and stuff like that, um, we, we do, when we evaluate, we don't always do it in terms of appreciating and celebrating um each other it, it, fully right and i think if we normalize what i was trying to say earlier is i think if we normalize um so if we normalize sharing more like um being sharing openly um and it's hard because um you can't control um what others will, will do the backlashes and there is still backlash today as we as we're seeing but um we do have control over whether we choose to be ourselves or not. So if we normalize being really open and sharing our stories really openly and all of our experiences, we'll find a, a lot more similarities than differences anyway. And um, what one other thing that will be normalized is seeing each other more holistically mm -hmm. and in more depth and detail. And that will, it, that will enable compassion, it will enable a domino effect whereby other people can share the same and that has a domino effect and we see that everyone is more the same than we realise but also a lot more so much themselves that we shouldn't really be comparing people in the way that um, we do all the time and until we do that we like yeah different things will come to light at different times so 
um, at times we're going to need to, and I know someone said in the chat, like there's discrimination happens throughout all walks of life, not just black and LGBT people. And yet mm. it does. And I can only speak to my experiences, but um, what I was more trying to say is not that it only happens within those communities and more that at different times, different things will come to light and there'll be different experiences whereby we're called to speak up on a certain thing until we get to a place where we can just appreciate um each other as human beings and not based on what we look like or who we love or mm. anything like that because really and truly that's no one else's business a <laughs> um and b yeah it, it just, <laughs> we're all, yeah um oh. we're all just human we're all human beings we, we're all the same in so many ways um yeah, did that actually answer your question? Because I feel like I'm. Oh, yeah, it did. It did. I, yeah, it just wanted to know. Um, obviously, with intersectionality only being like a word that's been thrown around since about 2015, that in certain certain aspects of, of your life, being obviously from the Bain black Bain background and LGBT, that there, there is going to be inequalities. Yeah. Inequality. So you might have a quality in your in your in your black self, or actually in your LGBT self that's nowhere near equality. So it's just, intersectionality is just a new thing, isn't it, that we're trying to work out and, as you say, respect everybody's individual little bubbles that make up a person holistically, which, yeah, you, you did answer it, to be honest, Corey. <laughs> Sweet. Thank you for joining us, Martin. I'll, get, I'll get you um, the stairs to remove you from the stage. Uh, oh, wait, you're gone. Perfect. Um, Okay, cool. So we've got a few minutes. We might run over a little bit, um, which hopefully people won't mind too much because there are loads of questions and loads of things going on in the chat. Um, just interested, I guess, like a lot of people here are talking about um, colleagues. Um, so, you know, how, how we can support, you know, because these kinds of things are going to be happening to people that you walk down the street next to, people you work with, you know, family members and stuff like that. So I just wondered what we can do to you know create great allies how people can be a good ally you know what we can do within our organizations to start some of these conversations off other than you know maybe celebrating pride and things like that you know it needs to be much more than that doesn't it so um again if we've got some kind of logical order if we start with john um and then Stephen, that would be great just just from a house power perspective and in terms of allyship and things like that um it's so important because um House Proud only really exists because we have organizational LGBT networks as well. And those organizational LGBT networks, the kind of foundation stone is basically just people getting involved, right? And, and people trying to have that internal influence within an organization to get stuff done and, and to get things underway. So, so allyship is, is so important for, um, for helping to kind of foment that, that kind of um, that environment and that climate to, to get things happening. Um, it's also so important um, because it's really important to embrace kind of really proactive allies as well um, because they help to get things done. And I, th I think it's all basically about getting things done. And, and so some of the practical ways that that could help within organisations is um, we have a really um, good ally within Clarion, uh, Cathy, who lives in Brighton. Her husband's a DJ. So, so for us, for when we go into Brighton Pride, that's fantastic because she's there on the ground in Brighton and her husband does a DJing at the back of the float. So I think that's just a really practical example of, of how allyship can really work in, a, in an organisation. Brilliant. Thanks, John. Stephen? Uh, I, I think that allyship, I, I mean, I absolutely agree that it's, com it's hugely important in every workplace that there's this culture of LGBTQ plus inclusion and that we really champion allyship. I think one of the ways that you can do it is by thinking about the language that you use and um, really about not making any assumptions. So you see at the start of our presentations today, we introduced our pronouns. And that's kind of something that still feels a bit new for some people. You know, they're like, well, of course, your pronouns are he and him. You've got a big ginger lockdown beard. You know, like what else would your pronouns be? But of course, that's not true. You know, pronouns are very personal and it's... Um, it's absolutely okay to ask someone what their pronouns are. The other thing that I think can really help in organizations is when you've got um, leadership and senior leadership who are LGBTQ plus, 
And I would really encourage them to be super out in the organization. So before I had this job, I used to work at Bernardo's, the children's charity. And I used to go in on a Monday morning and be like, well, my husband and I had a lovely weekend this weekend, you know, just really demonstrating to everybody that not only is it acceptable for you to be yourself in the workplace, actually it's expected. It's absolutely okay for you to um, share stories about your partner, whether they're same sex or different sex. It's absolutely okay for you to talk about, you know, your gender identity, you know, all of those kind of things. And I'm always reminded of a friend of mine who I used to work, I'm a social worker and my background is in social work and she's a social worker too. And she used to at work talk about her husband and her husband's name was Gloria. And, that you know, it was a woman that she'd been with for many, many years. But at work, she found it much easier to just pretend that he was that she was a guy so that nobody would ask any questions and things like that. And I think a really good way of of helping people see that they don't have to do that is by just asking them, you know, if you don't know, oh, is your partner a man or a woman? Oh, right. OK, cool. You know, like that's just a really nice way of doing what Corey was talking about, which is just normalizing the experience of having LGBTQ plus people in your network. Amazing. Thank you. Some really good tips there, hopefully, for people to take away. Um, and just before we kind of bring ourselves into the final session, and this might be a challenge because I realize we're all quite chatty. Um, if you just have like 30 seconds each to kind of how do we stop this just being an ongoing conversation? So I think one of the striking things for me is that when I hear about the experiences of Lucia and Angela, that that was nearly 50, well, it was 50 years ago, you know, when they were basically having the same conversations. And yes, some things will have improved, but then you hear Corey speak and actually a lot of those issues are still really quite prominent. Um, and certainly things that, that we probably all experienced here on this panel, you know, pretty frequently. So what 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 are your hopes you know if we were sat here in 10 years time a year's time whatever it might be what what do you want to have seen changed or you know what are, what are the things you'd like to see people start doing after today so if we again just go john stephen and then finish on, on corey that would be amazing so I, th I think there's been a clear progression um of where things have improved and i think they focus in different areas so if you think about the stonewall workplace quality index clearly has helped for the workplace and then we look at kind of a house power pledge scheme which delivers something very specific which is around housing governance um but where we need to get to now is, is really to hear kind of the voices of lgbt residents as well and that's very much linked in with the social housing green and the social housing white paper and so just from a house power perspective where we hope to get to uh with the next phase of the work is potentially to set up a network group for lgbt residents um and it's those voices that i think will really then affect change within the sector. Great, thanks. Stephen? I think for me, um, it's all about partnership working. You know, we recognise that we're not going to be able to do this on our own. You know, we want every single LGBTQ person in the country to have access to services that meet their specific needs. And, and I want to do that in partnership with people who are already working with those people. So you know, having events like this, building partnership. I've already had a few people email me saying, hey, let's work together. Let's do it. You know, like, let's find a way to take those, take all of those ideas forward. And for us at Stonewall Housing, that's about this national helpline for LGBTQ plus people that have got some kind of homelessness or housing issue, and then working in partnership with organizations all over the country to make sure that they've got the access to the services that they need. Amazing. Thank you, Stephen. And finally, Corey, Corey, aka Superman. I think the hat is like perfectly quality for, for this event and how you've been. So we'll finish on you if that's okay. Um I, I think um that what one thing I, I hope that happens is I know that conversations have been started, as you said, like we've been having conversations and stuff like that. But I just want to echo like what Stephen was saying about um um asking questions and stuff like that. I feel like although that continues the conversation, I feel like um, we've we've li people have listened at times to things and there has been progress made, but um, I still think there's a sense of like sometimes we make judgments before we ask questions, and there's only so far that conversations can go from there, um, and 
yeah, and I mean that in terms of like different things, like um, with, like, and I've experienced that in terms of like some people when I'm trying to explain clinical depression to them, they're like, no, you're just being lazy, and I'm like, oh well, here's my doctor's details. Go and um, but um, also I feel like right now within society, I feel like certain narratives are featured. And there's um so there's that in the forefront. There, like when we turn on TV, when we look at billboards or the media or things like that, there are certain narratives that are normal just because they've always been there. And yeah, they are very heteronormative, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's still people's reality realities. But in terms of putting other narratives at the forefront in a more proportionate way, um, and normalizing those narratives existing and then being just as normal, just as real for the people that they are just as real for, um, for us, um, we, it, we just educating and training and hammering things into us ourselves as opposed to just having the conversations, I think, would, would help a lot more. It's just, I think it's a constant process of normalization and acceptance and celebration. And I've said that a lot. Um, but yeah, that's that's the way I feel. Amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you um, to everyone for staying with us for the panel. We do have 10 minutes um, left, but I would like to, to thank John and Corey as um, they get dragged off stage, <laughs> not too unceremoniously, but thank you so much for your contributions today. Um, really interesting perspectives. Um, and yeah, it takes great courage, you know, in any situation to come and talk about some of these things when you've experienced it yourself with both John and Corey. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, hopefully what we should be able to do now for the final 10 minutes or so is welcome um, Kat and Tina onto stage from Stonewall Housing. So you, you've heard them referenced a lot throughout today. We've partnered as the CIH with Stonewall Housing to deliver the event. Um, and some of the questions were really about, well, what can we do? You know, people feel inspired, they feel pumped to do something. And um, what we wanted to do was really end on a high note um, where we could go through some of the really good resources and things that are available um, to people. So um, if I hand over, I think, um, to Stephen or Kat and let these guys take it away for these final 10 minutes. And if you all have your notepads at the ready, hopefully you'll get some really good ideas to take away and um, start working on straight away. I'm Stephen. <laughs> I was on mute there, Kat. Um, let, me, let me kick off by um, thinking about some of the things that I said in my presentation. I think there's a real opportunity today for everybody who's here, whether you work in an organisation that is already really LGBTQ plus inclusive, or if you work in, or, in an, an organisation where actually it feels a bit kind of far away and it feels a bit foreign to you, I think what everyone can do is go back to your organization and start that conversation. Have the conversation with the senior managers, have the conversation with um, the people who make the decisions about that organization and ask them what it is they're doing to make sure that they're LGBTQ plus inclusive. There's some really simple things that can kick you off on this journey. You know, I, this, I love this idea of, of you being on your coming out journey and you know us being able to support you around that. I think John's offer around the House Pride Pledge is a fantastic way to start and also one that isn't really intensive in terms of resources. It doesn't cost you any money to do the House Pride Pledge. And what a wonderful way to demonstrate to your colleagues, to the staff that you work with and to your service users that you're serious about this. And then follow that up with some training for your staff help them feel confident to ask those questions. I saw someone in the Q&A earlier that we do ask the questions, but no one tells us whether they're LGBTQ plus or not. Think about some of the things that, um, that might be the reason for that, you know, and think, right, how can I make sure that this organization is doing what it needs to do? I think um, Tina will talk about it in more detail, but I think the uh, inclusion standard that we have that kind of builds on the House Pride Pledge and really demonstrates again that you're, as one of the housing organisations in the UK, you're dedicated to LGBTQ plus issues. And I think as well, one of the things I often say to people is don't give yourself a hard time if you haven't, you know, you're not far enough on that journey yet. Even if you're right at the start of it, don't worry about that. You know, like don't give yourself a hard time. If you get things wrong, 
that's all right. We all get stuff wrong, you know, but just put, make sure you've got a really nice plan in place for um, for your journey, your coming out story, so that your staff can come out and your service users can come out too. That's kind of my summary, Rebecca, of um, of what I think people could actually do to move things forward. Kat, shall I hand over to you? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so I came on briefly before and I realised I didn't really introduce myself. My name's Kat. My pronouns are she and her and I'm the fundraising and initiatives manager for Stonewall Housing. I've worked at Stonewall Housing for over 10 years and I've seen, I've worked in lots of different roles across the organisation and I've seen us move forward in ways that we didn't think were possible um, just a few short years ago. Um, in 2019, I took up fundraising and initiatives and I started the House of Stonewall because we had so many service users who had written us cards and emails and letters and phone calls from people as far back as the 80s saying, you literally saved my life. Like, I don't know where I would have been without Stonewall Housing. People like Corey, um, who's just fantastic. My phone has not stopped ringing about how amazing he is. So thank you again, Corey, for coming to speak today. And it's those stories that I thought, this is what people need to hear. These are the stories, this is the impact uh, that will really make a difference when it comes to being more inclusive in your own services and also commissioning services like ours to keep this good work going. Um, the House of Stonewall is all, it's a collective. It's about our current service users and our alumni coming together to help feed back into service delivery, uh, work on projects um, and campaigns for the organisation to raise awareness and raise fundraising. And then we've got our champions. Champions can be individuals, they can be monthly donors, they can be corporates, they can be our partners, they can be providers that all help us raise uh, awareness and, and help us achieve our, our mission to end LGBT homelessness. So if anybody wants to know about how to join the House of Stonewall or talk to us about our upcoming projects, please just email me at stonewallhousing.org. You'll all be sent a follow-up email with direct links to email me, Tina and Stephen, um, to talk about anything, um, any ideas you have for this event. A real friendly bunch. We're always up for collaborating. We're always up for partnership work. We've got some really exciting projects with the House of Stonewall this year, including, I mentioned earlier in the chat, a series about uh, faith, religion, ethnicity and culture, a BNB and me and how this relates to housing. We're always looking for sponsorship. We're always looking for venues. Um, and when we're back in the real world, we will be making a splash. We will be coming out with our events, you can look on our YouTube and, and look at some of the things that we've done before. Um, our Pride video, I believe, is um, in the room, in the networking room today. Um, and our Queer Story video um, of our event for LGBT History Month last year uh, should be available too. So don't be shy, get in touch, go on my LinkedIn, email me, email my boss, email my colleagues. We really want to work with people and, and build the house of Stonewall. So that's all I have to say. Handing over to Tina. <laughs> um, hi, I'm going to do training in two seconds, or as quick as I can fit it in in two minutes. So my name is Tina Warren. I'm Director of Education and Engagement for Stonewall Housing, which means I'm involved in designing and delivering all of our training. Um, I'm, my pronouns are she and her. I work for Stonewall Housing for, oh gosh, about nine years now. Started off working in our older people's work. Um, and like I say, it's my responsibility to deliver all of our training and, and what our training includes. And I think what I'd like to start by saying is that, you know, at the heart of our training are people's narratives and people's stories, people like Corey, the people that we work with, the experiences that we have of housing providers and local authorities. And we we do for, a, you know, small, a reasonably sized organisation, we actually do quite a lot of training. We've trained something like 1800 people in the last two years. And that includes moving everything onto Zoom in March time in quite, quite a short space of time. Um, and we we do a lot of different training courses. It's interesting what John was saying about the no place like home and people not feeling safe about maintenance operators, because one of the pieces of training that we do is about training contractors and training maintenance operators. And it builds on some work we've already done with London and Quadrant and Shepherds Bush Housing. And in actual fact, we're going to I'm starting that piece of work next week with another organization. And we go from doing that to doing our inclusion standard, which is this audited quality mark. 
Um, and that was originally designed for older people's services and it's held by Notting Hill Genesis. They're the only people who hold it at the moment. And we've widened that now to include any housing provider. And it includes consultancy about anything that impacts LGBTQ customers. It's about training and it has an audit process that we hope will involve residents of, of the provider who are doing the inclusion standard. So we, we provide a wide range of training. Um, I won't give you the whole long list because there's a whole long list, but we look at housing issues for LGBTQ people from BMER communities, which addresses some of those issues that were spoken about earlier. Uh, older LGBTQ people in care and support settings, supporting LGBTQ families in housing need, trans people in housing policy, housing options for older LGBTQ people, LGBTQ awareness in a housing context, um, amongst a lot of others. And it always starts with a conversation. Our training is bespoke to you. It's designed for you and with you. Um, obviously on Zoom at the moment. Um, and everyone who commissions our training gets a report on the completion of the training, which includes feedback data and an overview of training. And we can also tailor it to a specific campaign if you want to do something in, in LGBT History Month or Pride or World Homeless Day. It's all about what it is that your organisation needs from us in terms of training. Um, and it, you know, LGBTQ people, you've heard, you've heard Cora's story, you've heard lots of other people give examples of how LGBTQ people experience different needs and vulnerabilities and, and their experiences with housing and making sure your residents feel safe enough to be able to tell you about themselves, to tell you about some of those issues is, is really significant. You know, the smallest thing can make the difference. It can be as simple as asking about a pronoun. If you illustrate to a customer that you've thought about them it's a really powerful thing and it can be something so simple you know and our training is all about assisting providers to achieve high levels of good practice for lgbtq customers and and that's why we encourage somebody was saying earlier on about training you know i think i might be used to much about training senior managers you know we we would encourage organizations to do kind of company-wide training packages so from you know contractors to senior managers um yeah i think that's about it but you can reach me my email address is on my profile um i'm also going to be hosting um a virtual training drop-in if people want to know about that and i'm also going to chair an event uh in march around uh LDT women's health um, so if you can come to those please do but please email me if you want to have any discussions around training and how we can uh, you know best help your organization to achieve that really uh, good practice Right. <laughs> I'm very impressed with all three of you for fitting that into 10 minutes um, <laughs> after taking away five minutes of your time so um, thank you so much for partnering with us on this event Kat you've been amazing in the run-up to organizing all of it so well done to you thank you for all that you've done. I was, I was going to say this is the bit where everybody claps but um, so we'll virtually clap all of our speakers and all of our helpers for today. Thank you so much. The follow-up email will be with you in the next day or so. So please keep an eye on your inbox for that because that will have all of the links and the recordings from today's session. And um, please do get in touch with any of the guys if you've got any questions, any feedback for at CIH as to what the professional body can be doing more of on all of these issues. We would love to hear from people firsthand about that. Um, Tina, you're getting us your email. So if you can type that into the chat, that would be amazing. And we'll include it in the follow-up emails as well so everyone knows who's who. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. I'm really proud that we've been able to deliver an event like this for the first time through CIH and we couldn't have done it without any of you. So thank you so much. Um, and we hope to see you all soon. Keep an eye on our Twitter for the rest of the month for what's going on. There's loads of vlogs and videos on there as well. Um, and yeah, hopefully anything that you do do, no matter how small, will make a huge difference. I can promise you that because people will notice and it will give a lot of comfort to people. So take care, everybody. Keep staying safe and we'll see you on our next virtual event.